All right. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, so yeah, we're going to be talking about insects in your garden that are pests and ones that aren't pests. Um, I would say of all the topics, I probably get one of the most questions are about bugs and what, what the bugs are and how to stop them, how to deal with them. Um, because it can be extremely frustrating if you grow a great garden and then some insects come along and start chomping on all your little plants and the things, especially the things you want to eat. So that can be very frustrating. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of general background and then we're going to talk about how to actually control some insects different ways. And then the last part of our presentation will be the most common insect pests, the ones that you're most likely to run into as you garden. Um, a little bit of the general background is insects are actually animals, part of the animal kingdom. And they are very successful, meaning that they um, seem to cover the whole earth. They're everywhere, um, even, you know, far north, far south, anywhere you go in the world, you're going to find some bugs or insects. Um, there's many, many different kinds. Um, and they affect us in lots of different ways. Um, I would say people think that most insects are bad, but there's a lot of really good insects that are beneficial. And then there's a lot of what I would call neutral insects that don't really cause a problem. They don't really help. They're just out there doing their thing. So um, okay. let's look at um, good bugs versus bad bugs or insects. And really what it comes down to is we consider something good if it's beneficial and something bad if it's a pest, meaning it causes damage. So these are the good ones here. Um, anything that's a predator is generally considered good because that means it eats other insects. And so, you know, everyone's familiar with ladybugs, they eat aphids, but also praying mantis um, will eat almost anything that it can get its hands on. Um, spiders are predators, they eat other insects. There's a lot of beetles called ground beetles that will do that. Wasps are, some of them are predators. There's also some things like hoverflies and also dragonflies are predators. And then of course, the other part of good insect population are the pollinators, the ones that help to pollinate flowers that bring fruits. Um, so typically you think of honeybees and they are extremely important as pollinators, but bumblebees are also very important pollinators. And there's a whole bunch of other wild bees besides the honeybees and the bumblebees. Um, you hear a lot about mason bees, but there's, there's other bees that are all good pollinators. And then wasps, we often think of wasps as being like um, something that's dangerous and go going to sting you, but there's many, many species of wasps and most of them do not sting people, but they actually are pollinators. And some of them are also predators. So there's many, many different kinds of wasps. Um, and then butterflies also do a little bit of pollinating and moths as well. And then there's even some flies, not like your typical house fly, but there's other kinds of flies that do pollinating as they move from flower to flower. And the thing with pollinating is that, and typically like a honeybee, it's not trying to pollinate flowers on purpose. Uh, it just happens as kind of a side effect of, as it visits the flowers to get nectar, you know, for a food source so it can make honey. Um, they carry pollen on their legs and the backs of their bodies. And when they go to the next flower, it gets spread over there and that's how the pollination actually occurs. Um, but very, very important process. And a little bit about insect biology. Um, this is stuff we probably had in eighth grade or ninth grade or whenever you studied insects. So true insects, um, the adults, generally have three body sections, the, the head, uh, the thorax, which is kind of just that middle section, and then the abdomen, which is the lower section. So you can see all three parts. And, and not on all insects, it's not real clear sometimes which the parts. Obviously, you can see the head, but sometimes the thorax and the abdomen are not well defined. Um, but also true insects will generally have six legs, and they'll also have two sets of wings, um, but not necessarily. 
and some insects are wingless. And then also one pair of antennae. And then also what we call true insects have an exoskeleton, which means they don't have bones on the inside of their body. They just have kind of a hard outer body shell. And that's what protects their in, inward parts. Um, that's called the exoskeleton. So that is your little refresher course on insect biology. And then on um, insect life cycles, this is something I remember learning a lot about in school, um, the different types of metamorphosis, which just means what are the different changes that an insect goes through in its life cycle. And so there's like four different kinds, and it's really not important that you remember each one specifically or whether which kind of insect is which one, but it might be useful to you in terms of when you're dealing with an insect pest, if you're aware of the different life cycles, um, Obviously, you know, when it's an egg, it's going to be in different shape than when it's an adult. And sometimes when it's a larva. And so sometimes it's like the, a different life cycle, that, different part of the life cycle um, that actually does the, the damage. And typically like larva, you know, like a caterpillar's larva, and they are the ones that do the eating. The actual butterfly itself doesn't eat um, plants. It goes around and just collects nectar. So it's just useful to know these different life cycle, uh, the different metamorphoses. So the first one is what they call simple or no metamorphosis, where it just is just goes from an egg to an adult. And that's it. Um, incomplete metamorphosis is where you go from an egg to a nymph to adult. It's only three stages. And then there's also gradual metamorphosis, where the once it hatches out, the nymph and the adult it really is kind of the same. It's just basically a size difference. And then the complete metamorphosis is where it goes from egg and then it has a larva and then the larva develops into a pupa and then the adult finally. Um, so here you can see the diagram of what happens with the, the, the butterfly or the moth because it goes through all those different stages and goes through. And sometimes there'll be two or three um, parts of being a larva where they, they molt and then even sometimes even four or five in this case and then you can see what the people looks like that's what we used to call a cocoon um, sometimes that language is still used and then of course it turned into a novel. another real part of important part of insect biology is what are their mouth parts like um, they don't really have teeth per se although some of them have jaws, um, but anyhow, because this will determine what kind of damage they can do and how they can affect your plants is what kind of mouth parts. So like chewing, there are chewing insects that actually have jaws and mandibles and they can chew holes in leaves and that, or chew holes in fruit. So obviously that can be very damaging. The other one is piercing and sucking type mouth parts. And so think of like, um, it's almost like it's injecting a hypodermic needle into the, the, the plant and then it's sucking out the, the juice or the, the plant liquids. In fact, right here in this picture of, of a squash bug, you can see it's long, skinny uh, mouth parts, just like a straw almost. And it's like a needle and it just pierces into, actually I think this is a stink bug, not just a regular squash bug. Um, but it's you know, attacking this tomato and it's sticking its mouth parts into the tomato and sucking it out. And, and generally there is, um, it has some enzymes involved that will dissolve the plant tissue so that it can ingest it. And then there is rasping and sucking, which is similar, but a little bit different um, than the previous one. And then there's sponging mouth parts and siphoning mouth parts where they're basically just kind of drinking nectar. Um, out of all these different types, the first one, the chewing one, is probably the biggest damaging, although the piercing and sucking is a close second. Um, and then also the rasping and sucking. The sponging and the siphoning do not do as much damage, and so they are not generally considered a problem. The other thing to be aware of is that many insects have host plants. Um, they favor certain plants or certain family of plants that to, to feed on because that's what they're used to eating. And in some cases, this is also the host plant that they like to lay their eggs on. 
And so if you're aware of this um, phenomenon of insect host plants, it can be helpful when you're trying to identify what is eating your, your plant. Uh, so a classic example of that would be like a cabbage worm or a cabbage looper, little green caterpillar to eat up members of the cabbage stem. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, they eat all the members of the cabbage family like broccoli and cabbage and kale and Brussels sprouts and cauliflower and collard greens. Um, and then they also lay their eggs, right? The butterflies lay the eggs right on the plant. So um, there, again, there are some plants that are specific to specific plants or specific family of plants. But then there's also some insects that just can feed on many, many different types. And so it's good to be aware of which ones those are too, because you're more likely to see them um, on different, different crops in your garden. And as far as the damage that they do, we talked about the, the chewing mouth parts that can chew holes and leaves. And so the big damage here would be that um, if it chews enough holes, the leaf won't have enough leaf surface to be able to do the photosynthesis that it needs to make food. And when I say make food, it's making food for the plant. Uh, you know, leaves have sunshine, have, they take, you know, they catch the sunshine and through the process of photosynthesis, um, they, they generate food that the plant uses to grow and develop. And so if there's too many holes in the leaves, the plant's ability to do that will be diminished and the plant won't grow as well. So if it's just a few tiny holes, uh, you know, it's not a big a deal. It doesn't mean the plant's going to die necessarily, um, but it just depends on how many insects there are and how much of the leaf surface they damage. Another kind of damage that, that insects can do um, is they can damage the fruits. And lots of times this happens when the fruits are just developing. And so insects will bore into the fruits um, sometimes they lay their eggs inside the fruit. Sometimes they're just going in there to eat. Um, and obviously nobody wants to eat anything that like there's an insect inside there, right? Um, the famous worm in the apple is actually a type of caterpillar that bores into the caterpillar. That's the, the codling moth caterpillar. And so that makes the apple pretty much inedible, although you can usually cut out the bad parts and still save the good parts if you're so inclined. Um, but definitely can reduce the quality of the fruit when insects penetrate. And also, in of course, the extreme case, the worst case scenario would make the entire fruit inedible. And then also here you see like a green bean that's been chomped into through the holes there. So that doesn't look very tasty. Um, and yet a third type of insect damage that happens would be where insects will carry disease from plant to plant. Almost like a bee would carry pollen from plant to flower to flower. Um, if, if an insect like, um, oh, I'm trying to think of an example, uh, a cucumber beetle visits a cucumber plant that is infected with a disease, and then it flies around and visits another cucumber plant to eat on that plant, it could be spreading a disease from plant to plant usually called, caused by the insects that have piercing and sucking mouth parts, could also be chewing mouth parts though too. Um, so they can spread viruses, fungus diseases from plant to plant. And yeah, here's an example of a cucumber plant that has been diseased. As far as insect control, um, lots of times what people are hoping is that they'll be able to control insects and kill them all and that's not necessarily very realistic and not even necessary. Um, what's important is to get enough insects under control so that there's not very much damage. You know, we can sustain a little bit of damage and it's not the end of the world. Sometimes you won't even notice it. Um, it's mostly when it gets to be enough damage that you notice it and it starts ruining your food. Um, so there is a concept in um, the horticulture world, uh, a term called IPM. And you'll see that if you read about insect control. Um, and so that stands for integrated pest management. And basically what that is, it's just a, an approach to controlling insects. And so integrated, of course, means 
that it's a combination of different techniques and using them in concert with each other. And so you're coordinating these different methods of controlling into one plan for controlling the pests. Um, and so then the pest, of course, is whatever organism is causing a problem. Today, we're talking about insects, but it could also be other animals are pests, weeds are pests, diseases are pests. So all of the, these different pests, um, integrated pest management deals with all of them. Uh, but today, we're just talking about the insects. And then again, management does not necessarily mean eradicating or the total elimination of the pest but rather getting it to a manageable level of control just to keep that, that damage at an acceptable level. One of the most important things in controlling insects and just as a gardener would be to learn how to identify the insects that are causing problems for your vegetable crops. Um, but if you know what it is, then you might know the best way to control it, or at least you can look it up. And you'll also be familiar with what kind of damage it will be and whether even if it's a pest at all. Sometimes you'll see a bug or an insect in your garden and it looks like it could be something terrible and it turns out it's not, doesn't hurt the plant at all. Or in some cases, it, it's actually beneficial. So um, when you have damage on your plants, what I tell people to do is try to look for the pest that's actually doing the damage. Um, Sometimes there are some things that basically just feed at night. So you may not see that, something like a slug um, or I don't know, some other, some other night feeders. Um, but also sometimes the, the insect is hiding in the plant, like underneath the leaves. Um, you may not see it right away. Sometimes they're very tiny. Um, so you may need the magnifying glass to take a look at it. Um, Sometimes it's actually already bored into the, the plant. So like in the case of like the squash vine borer, when the little caterpillars hatch out and they start feeding on the, um, the, the squash plant, they actually bore right into the stalk and so you can't see them. Um, so that is, makes it difficult to figure out what's going on. Um, so, but anyhow, look around, see what you can see. Um, if you don't see anything, then you might need some help. But um, if you do see something, you can try to cap capture it, um, put it in a little jar, um, catch one or several, and then look at it, you know, and, and try and look at guidebooks or internet resources. There's lots of great resources on the internet that will help you identify bugs. Uh, you can also submit a specimen, bring it into us here at Community Gardens. And we'll look at it, just bring it in a jar. Uh, also, the University Extension Service has a process by which you can send uh, insects for identification also. And there is a fee involved with that. But again, some pests can look similar to beneficial. And so it can be confusing sometimes. You just want to make sure you're not going to be doing some course of action that is going to kill insects, especially that might kill off your good bugs, especially the pollen, which are important. So just to kind of outline the components of this uh, process of integrated pest management, this approach to insect control. Um, of course, we just talked about identifying what, what the pest is, that's important. But also, um, and a lot of this will actually apply to like commercial growers. Um, people have like a huge field of say tomatoes or a huge field of squash or whatever. Um, they're gonna be doing these kinds of things probably a lot of this will be a little bit not to scale for you, but people do monitoring and sampling, meaning uh, they'll try and figure out how many pests are out there. <coughs> Excuse me. So a lot of times you'll see things like traps out in fields like that, and they have little sticky traps that are catching these insects. They have a thing that lures them in and they get caught there. And then they'll be able to count and see how many are happening and they'll know that that means like the population is building up and maybe they're going to need to do their control rather than just spraying the first time they see the first bug that might not be the best time to spray you might want to wait until the population is big enough that you use the spray that it's going to kill a lot of the insects and not just the few that are starting out so it's helpful to know the the um 
the life cycle of the pest, which once you identify it, you can look it up and find out what that life cycle looks like. Um, and then you can find out what are some preventative things. Oftentimes there's different cultural things, meaning the way that you grow the plant, like maybe you mulch, maybe you till at a certain time, maybe you put um, a row cover over to protect it. You know, there's different cultural things you can do uh, or even just the time that you plant. And we'll talk about some of these things in a little bit that will help you control the insect preventatively. Meaning if you do something a certain way, it might just prevent much damage that the insects won't think the environment is favorable for them. And so lots of times, once you do that, or if there's ways that you can modify the environment, um, and there's different ways to do that, of course, that can help control the insect. And then there's mechanical control. Uh, just a minute ago, I mentioned row cover. That actually would be a mechanical control because it's something physical. Um, and then there's biological control. That's where you're using some type of a, an organism like a fungus or a bacteria that can actually attack the insects. Or it could also be um, other insects. If you release them into the, your, the environment where your crops are growing, if you can release some good predators in there, um, that's a form of biological control also, and they will eat the bad insects. And then just the other important part of IPM is just responsible pesticide use. Rather than just reaching for the spray bottle, uh, pesticide, insecticide, when you see the first insect in, and even if you don't know what it is, just start spraying, hoping that it'll somehow do what you want. That is not being responsible. Um, Am I responsible by a figuring out what the insect is and knowing what material to use and at what point do you use it? And also then also following the instructions very carefully, meaning um, you don't want to spray sometimes at certain times of the day because you might be affecting the bee population. Um, also, you don't want to use more than the right amount because A, it may not be effective, but B, if you use higher amounts, it could be toxic for you, could be toxic for the plants different things like that. And um, so you just want to be responsible um, when you're using pesticides, even if they are organic pesticides. Um, it is important to think about when is the most vulnerable um, stage of life. That's when you want to do the insect control. Um, that's when it will be the most effective. Typically the eggs, you know, because it's like, inside a shell there, um, you can spray that and nothing will happen, it won't penetrate that egg um, shell. Um, and the pupa too, like the cocoon type thing, that's kind of a protective covering. So if you spray something, that's not gonna affect it. That's why sometimes certain insect control, like if you're spraying for spider mites, it will tell you to go ahead and spray and then spray again three days later because that's when the eggs will have hatched out. So, um, but the vulnerable stages of life are typically the immature stages rather than the adults. Sometimes the adult stage just has a very hard shell and pesticides don't penetrate that shell very well. But sometimes that's the only time you can spray uh, is when the adults are present. And so sometimes insecticides are effective against adults. But often the, the vulnerable, the larva, like the caterpillar stage, or these nymphs, these are squash bug nymphs here in this picture. Their, their, their shell or their, their outer covering is very soft, it's not hard yet. And so the pesticide will penetrate into that and it's easier to control them at that stage. And pesticide safety, safety um, tying back to using pesticides responsibly, you wanna do that in a safe manner. We do recommend organic sprays. Um, and just the simple answer on that is they don't persist in the environment too long. Um, there's many synthetic chemicals um, and by design, they last a long time in the environment. In fact, some of them, some of the older chemicals which aren't even being used legally in this country anymore, things like DDT uh, persist for a very long time. In fact, uh, if you're, uh, most people here actually have some DDT in their, um, uh, fat cells right now just because of all the DDT that was sprayed many, many years ago. Um, and so um, 
for certain chemicals like that that just persist in the environment. But the, the organic sprays break down quickly and they don't stay around as long, which means they don't kill insects for as long. So you have to be um, wise in how you use them and when you use them. Um, but at least they don't persist in the environment where they're going to be a problem, you know, a week from now, two weeks from now. It's always important to follow directions. And, you know, if you've read the instructions on a pesticide lately, they can be pretty complicated. Um, but it's still it's very important to read it, look at all the safety precautions that it tells you to wear uh, facial coverings or, you know, uh, long sleeves, whatever it tells you to do, um, you should do that. Of course, you don't want to spray in windy days because it could blow the pesticide in places you don't want it to, including it could blow it right back on you. Um, and you do want to wear proper protection, as I was mentioning a moment ago. There are some garden insects that are pretty common, and lots of times people see them and they get pretty worried that they are going to hurt their plants. And not even all of these are insects, um, but some of the ones that you know are pretty common would be ants. Um, people see ants all the time. They think that they're going to be hurting their plants. But ants generally do not hurt plants. Um, they don't. They aren't chewing on the leaves. They aren't damaging the leaves. Um, dragonflies are just scary. I remember as kids, we were under the impression that dragonflies could sting you, and you know people think that they could be a bad pest. They're actually a beneficial um, flies. Even though they're annoying, you know, house flies and other types of flies generally are not pests on plants, um, at least the common flies that you typically see. Um, and then, of course, there's non insects like spiders. There are many people who are just frightened of spiders for different reasons. And I know that could be a real, a, a, a real problem for some people to have that arachnophobia um, that it isn't, you know. People get scared and it's, it's legitimate. You know, those spiders can be um, kind of alarming, um, but they are beneficial in the garden. Um, and so I don't recommend just killing spiders. Uh, just kind of let them be. Um, at least they're not in your house, so that's good. Um, roly polies, the little creatures up here in the upper right hand corner. Um, most children and most people are familiar with them. Um, they don't do a lot of damage, they feed on organic matter. Um, and things like centipedes, those are just, you'll see them and they're not really damaging your plants either. So just, you know, when you see something, don't just assume that it's damaging your plants, that it's a pest, but try and figure out what it is and then do a little research. Common garden pests. All right, now we're going to look at some of the things that you're likely to see and the ones that are likely to cause damage for you. Um, this is just a, a, a composite picture of several. The one on the top, of course, is slugs. They're nasty. Um, the one in the left-hand corner is a cabbage looper, um, caterpillar that eats members of the cabbage family. The one on the right, that's a squash bug there, another nasty pest. So let's look at some specific ones. Aphids. Aphids are um, very small insects. They're kind of hard to see. Um, Typically, they'll be green. Sometimes they're orange or red. Um, sometimes they're black or dark. Um, they attack many different kinds of plants. And uh, they don't eat big holes, so you're not going to see holes in the leaves. Um, but they weaken plants by um, doing their piercing and sucking. And so they damage the leaves. And if enough of them are feeding, they can uh, stump the growth of plants, damage the ability of the plant to photosynthesize. Um, but also aphids, because they move around and they um, are doing the piercing and sucking mouth part thing, um, they can spread diseases, especially um, virus, things, virus diseases. They can multiply very fast, especially when the temperatures are warm. Um, and so we see these a lot in our greenhouse, and because um, the greenhouse is like a perfect condition for aphids to grow. And um, so we have started using a, a kind of a biological control called lace wings. And lace wings are insects that have um, larvae that when they are in the larva stage, they will eat uh, aphids and eat many aphids. 
So that's something we've had good success with. And some people are actually using lacelings in their backyards and you can purchase them online and get them shipped out and place them about your garden that will help to label. Typically you're gonna see aphids um, at the tips of the, the leaves or tips of the, the shoot, the stalk. That's where the new leaves are coming out, that's where it, the new growth is succulent. Wherever the new growth is, that's where aphids are most likely to be because it's easier for them to penetrate with their piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, but sometimes we'll just see them spread out over the leaf, like here in this bottom picture. There's a whole bunch of aphids on the underside of this leaf. And you see some smaller, some larger. And so um, they can just be a really bad pest. And they're kind of creepy looking when you look at them up close. Um, ladybugs are also a natural um, control for aphids. And sometimes people will purchase ladybugs. Um, ladybugs are great, but sometimes they will fly away and may not stay around. But they will eat aphids. Excuse me. Um, so different controls. Um, you can actually use water. If you don't have a lot of plants, um, you can actually use a strong stream of water. And the way that I'll do that is I'll take like my left hand and I'll hold the plant up so that when I shoot it with the stream of water, it doesn't like knock the plant over, doesn't break off any leaves. And if it's the underside of the leaf, I'll kind of turn the underside up. And then I'll, with my right hand, I'll have a, a, a hose with a nozzle and I'll spray and I'll just wash, use the spray to wash away, just like you'd be washing your car, wash away those aphids. And that works pretty effectively. Um, so that is very simple and not toxic, of course. Um, if you get aphids really bad in the greenhouse, you've got too many plants or out in your yard, um, you can use um, some organic sprays, organic insecticides like pyrethrum, uh, neem oil, different things. Um, and of course, there's also some products called insecticidal soaps that can be used, and, and those are very effective also. But you'll see recipes for homemade insecticidal soap using dish soap. I'm not a big fan of the homemade uh, recipes just because different dish soap have different strengths. Sometimes they have other things added to them and it's hard to get the amount right to know what will be effective. So if you're gonna use the, the soap concept, I recommend you actually purchase what they call an insecticidal soap, which is available at the garden centers. All right, so um, after aphids, let's be looking at um, the imported cabbage worm um, and also the cabbage looper. So this is what, if you're not keeping an eye on your broccoli, your kale, your cabbage, and you're not watching them, you know, on a regular basis, you could come out sometimes and this is what you might see. And that's why it's important to start looking at your plants. You know, if you haven't gotten to the habit of this, I recommend it highly. Um, you know, once, twice a week, you know, I like to go out and look at my garden. You know, I'm going to go out and see if something's ready to harvest, right? Uh, but while you're doing that, be looking for insect damage, be looking for insects. And so we call that scouting, you're scouting to see what's out there. You start seeing little holes in your cabbage, your broccoli, then you know that caterpillars are probably present. You can lift up the leaf and take a look. Uh, rather than waiting till they get to this stage when they're so bad that really it's almost like might as well just pull those plants out and throw them away. Um, so um, keep your eye open for things and you'll see stuff. So the imported cabbage worm, if you've ever seen white butterflies flying around, we usually think of butterflies as, you know, a good thing because they're pretty to look at and um, they're just, you know, a good feeling when you see butterflies, especially like monarch butterflies or black swallowtails, you know. Um, but the white butterflies you see is the butterfly of the imported cabbage worm. And it is a slender green caterpillar. Um, the larva you'll see here in this picture here, see how long and straight this is. This is an eating machine that will eat up your broccoli, your cabbage, your kale, your cauliflower, um, all the members of the, the cabbage family. And you can control it with an organic material called BT, which is short for Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, but typically people just say BT. 
There's different brand names to it. Uh, you can get it as a dust, you can get it as a liquid. And what's great about it is it only affects members of the caterpillar family. Won't affect other insects, won't affect beneficials, doesn't affect pets uh, or, or fish in the pond, doesn't affect you as an adult or a child. So it's very safe to use. And a similar one is a product called spinosum. And that is also a bacterial-based insecticide. It's a little more broad spectrum. It will affect some beetles and some other insects too, which is good. Um, but again, very, very safe. There's a brand name for that you'll see sometimes called Captain Jack's. Um, and it uh, is just the brand name for spinosum. So um, both of these materials will you know, control the imported cabbage worm. Uh, if you can get the dust for the, the BT, um, so that's a brand name of Dipel dust. It's just a white powder you can sprinkle out on your seed, your uh, cabbage, broccoli plants, or a member of that family, and do it periodically. But you want to do it after a rain, it's before the rain, so it won't get washed off. And then there's the cabbage looper, which is similar in the damage it causes, but it's a little bit different. Instead of being the larva of that white butterfly, it's the larva of a night flying moth, a gray moth you see here in the picture here. And so you typically won't see that moth. It will just be flying around at night and it will let eggs and then you'll have little tiny uh, caterpillars. And it's a little bit different. It's what they call an inchworm type. As opposed to that other one that was long and straight. This one here moves about by doing the inchworm motion. Um, and again, it feeds on all those same members of the cabbage family and can, can be controlled with the same control with the BT or the spinel. Um, another common pest on potatoes, um, different, different crop potatoes, um, is the Colorado potato beetle. And um, it is in more places in Colorado. It's everywhere. Um, although it's not something you're going to see every year. And it used to be worse and then different parts of the country do get it more often if it's a big potato growing area. We're not in a big commercial potato growing area, so it's not unusual, excuse me, to not have this pest. Now it's just every few years maybe you'll have it, uh, maybe you'll never have it. Um, and typically what you'll see is um, these larvae, these really strange, ugly looking creatures, and they're eating holes in your leaves, your potato leaves and the beetles, um, so both the larvae and the adults feed on the, the leaves of the potatoes. They're kind of hard to kill with sprays, uh, but you can use the organic spray spinosis. Uh, that works well on these critters. Um, also, you can, if you don't have very many, you can pick them off by hand. Uh, some people, that doesn't appeal to them because it, it's just they get creeped out, you know, by, by bugs and touching them with their hands, but uh, a lot of farmers, that's what they used to do is, is like pay children to go and pick off potato beetles off their potatoes. Um, so it's not too difficult. difficult. You can drop them in a bucket and get rid of them later, drown them, or whatever you want to do. Um, but anyhow, um, just keep your eyes open if you have potatoes and you see holes in your leaves, there's a good chance this would be the culprit. Um, spotted cucumber beetle is probably one of the biggest garden pests. And you might think, well, gosh, I don't even grow cucumbers, but they also feed on other things. Um, the larva of the spotted cucumber beetle actually feed on the roots of corn plants. Uh, so sometimes you might hear about um, the corn rootworm um, that farmers are struggling with because it's attacking the, the roots of their corn plants. And so they're trying to kill it. Um, but in the garden, the adults will feed on pollen from different flowers, like the squash and the cucumber flowers. And sometimes they'll be chomping on the, the flowers themselves and ruining them, chewing holes in them. Um, you can also spread diseases like bacterial wilt in the cucumbers and cantaloupes and things like that. They do kind of pick on cucumbers and cantaloupes a lot because um, they're closely related. Um, and they're pretty difficult to control, um, but depending on the season and, and what time you spray and things like that, neem oil, pyrethrin, and spinosis are probably the best choices for trying to control this pest. Um, 
I've also had people get confused with this bug and thinking that it's like some member of the ladybug family. And it is distantly related. Of course, it is a beetle as the ladybug is a, or is a beetle, sometimes called the ladybird beetle. Um, and it has spots, but instead of being red, it has kind of yellow chartreuse color and it has the black spots, but it is not a beneficial insect. It's a very damaging pest. All right, let's look at the um, cutworm. Um, cutworm is another type of caterpillar or larva. It's going to be devastating to young seedlings as they're, you know, you plant seeds and little seedlings come up. And, or if you're putting out young plants like a baby tomato plant, um, a cutworm will come along. And what it does is it kind of circles around. You can see up here in this picture right here, a corn plant a very tiny corn plant. And what it does is it wraps itself around the stalk and kind of eats around it in a circle. And basically it's just like it's chopping down a tree. So what you'll see is um, the top of the plant, like in this case, the top of the corn stalk, little baby corn stalk is just there. It doesn't eat that part. And here's the base. It just, you know, ate around in a circle until it falls over and there it is. So if you see that, pretty sure you have cut marks. And a lot of that damage does happen at night. They seem to feed at night. Um, the adults are moths, um, so you typically won't see them because they're flying around at night. Um, but if you see that kind of damage, you know you've got them. You can control them with uh, uh, BT, of course, because it affects all members of the caterpillar family. Um, sometimes people also make like a little paper collar, like that's what they did right here, a uh, little paper thing around the, the tomato plant just so the cutworms can't get at it. I've also seen people sometimes put like a little bit of aluminum foil around the stalk of their tomato plant or pepper plant if they had damage. Lots of times it doesn't happen. It just depends if they are small enough and succulent enough. Um, because once the tomato plant gets very big or the pepper plant gets big or whatever plant, um, the stalk is harder and they can't chomp all the way through it. So it doesn't, doesn't really affect it. They can't do it. Um, but if you are having a problem, you can try BT. You can also try hand picking and also putting the paper collars around the plant stalks. All right, let's talk about another caterpillar. As you'll notice, many, many caterpillars are pests because they are eating machines. Basically, in the caterpillar stage, the larva stage, they're eating so that they can get ready to do the, the pupa. And so then when they're in the pupa, they're not eating, so they have to store enough food to survive until they turn into the moth or butterflies that you're going to turn into eventually. Parsley worm is interesting. Um, it's actually kind of a beautiful caterpillar, um, probably one of the most interesting ones. Um, when we have them in our children's garden, we like to show them to children because they're just very interesting to watch and watch them eating. Uh, but what's interesting is the adults of the parsley worm, this caterpillar, are the black swallowtail butterfly, which is a beautiful butterfly. Um, but it can be a pest, uh, the larva, the caterpillar, because it can eat um, your plants, but pretty much it only eats members of the carrot family. So obviously carrots, but other members of the carrot family would include uh, like parsley, um, hence the name, uh, but also um, dill, cilantro, um, other, other crops like that, um, Queen Anne's lace, um, so all those things are members of the carrot and parsley family and um, will be prone to attacks. But typically when I do see this caterpillar, it's not like there's hundreds of it. It might just be one or two on your parsley plant. And you know what? If that's not eating too much of your parsley plant, you can just let it be because it is going to turn into a beautiful butterfly. Uh, if it is a pest, you can just pick it off. Um, if you had serious infestation, you could use BT. Um, I typically haven't seen that serious of an infestation that require BT. If it's just eating your parsley or cilantro and it makes you unhappy, just pick them off and get rid of them. It's probably the easiest thing to do. Um, if you are interested like in a science project for kids and you wanna raise some butterflies, this is the best um, plant to do that. If you're trying to teach kids about the life cycle, um, because what you can do is capture this 
and put it in a jar. Uh, but when you capture it, capture it with the stalk that it's feeding on, and then um, stick that in a little vase of water inside a jar, and then uh, get some extra leaves in there and stick that in the water too, and provide lots of food. And you can just watch it, and it will just continue to eat and eat for a few days, and then it will make the pupa. And as it does that, then it will stop feeding and disappear and make the pupa. And then in approximately 21 days, I think it is, or 28 days, have to look that up. Um, that pupa will um, hatch, or not hatch, but um, the adult butterfly will emerge from the pupa, and then the butterfly will fly away. So that's a really fun thing to do for kids, uh, and just fascinating for anyone to watch that happen. So, grasshoppers, on the other hand, um, are not part of the moth and butterfly family. They are a totally different family. And they are not specific on one particular plant, but they attack many, many kinds of plants. And grasshoppers are terrible pests. Um, there's different kinds, um, but they have large chewing mouth parts. They can chew a lot of holes. Lots of times, if you don't see the insect, um, but you see holes, lots of times it is grasshopper damage um, because what happens is they'll stop and they'll eat a little bit and then they'll have to fly away to some other plant and just try something else. Um, they do like to uh, inhabit um, tall grass and weeds. Um, so if you wanna control them, um, keep the grass and the weeds very short around your garden, meaning mow regularly and mow short. Um, if you let stuff grow up and get tall, you're just gonna be inviting grasshoppers because you're making lots of food from them and then they're gonna jump into your vegetable crops and start eating things there, which is not good. So um, they're difficult to control, um, especially once they get very large, they just have such a hard exoskeleton, their outer covering that the, most pesticides don't bother them. Um, but when you see little baby grasshoppers, which is in the early part of the season, like right now, if you start seeing a lot of them, you could spray with some organic sprays like the neem oil um, and, and get some control. Um, I've also had um, read accounts and uh, we, we did it one year when we were having a problem with some grasshoppers here at our children's garden, um, is we use some poison bait. Um, and the way you do that is um, there's different things you can look that up on how to do that for grasshoppers. But if you, you get something, uh, a product called like bran, wheat bran. Uh, it's a grain product and grasshoppers love it. It's just something they really like to eat. And so what you can do is you can put that out in a little tray and you can spray that wheat bran with some um, good grasshopper killer like uh, uh, seven or some other products, you know, chemical that you wouldn't normally just spray in your garden, but you're just gonna be putting it on that bait. And then it will just attract um, the, cat, the, the grasshopper, and they'll come and eat it, and that will help control that. Uh, of course, anytime you'd be using a product like that, you want to be really careful because you don't want to leave it out where like dogs or cats or children would come along and eat that bait. Um, uh, it, it's the tastiest stuff, but um, you never know what kids and dogs and cats are going to eat. So um, but that's still a way to control things when it's you have a, a big problem. But keeping the grass short, <coughs> excuse me, short and the weeds short around your garden will be a huge step towards controlling grasshoppers. All right, then there's harlequin bugs. And when you hear the term bug, lots of times people just think that means any kind of insect, but there's actually a whole group, a whole family or order of insects um, called bugs. They're called the true bugs. Um, and so we already talked about beetles. We talked about members of the caterpillar, butterfly, moth family, the lepidoptera, um, and the beetles are the coleoptera. And then the, the bugs, the true bugs are called chemiptera. Not that you need to remember those Latin names, but just be aware that there are a whole group of them. And they are difficult to control because they have very hard shells, um, especially the adults that make it difficult to get them with any kind of sprays. 
and there's many different kinds of bugs, but this one right here is called the harlequin bug. Uh, it feeds on members of the cabbage family. Um, you don't see it quite as often as you do the cabbage loopers and the cabbage worms, but you will encounter it. And um, it is something just to be aware of, and you'll see them. It's kind of a bright, interesting looking insect. I typically see them a little bit later, uh, late summer, early fall. I see them more often. Um, and they have piercing, sucking mouth parts, and they will uh, generally just disfigure the leaves and make the leaves not good, especially if it's a leaf you're trying to eat, like a cabbage leaf or a kale leaf or something. Um, so um, the sprays have limited effect, especially on the adults. Um, some people use a combination of safer soap and neem or safer soap and pyrethrin, and that can be helpful. Um, if you see the eggs underneath the leaf, this is what they look like. This is a, an enlargement. They're not that large, they're kind of tiny, but they're interesting. They look like little barrels and they have stripes on them. And you'll see a little cluster of them and they'll know those are eggs. So you can knock them off if you want, but also that will let you know that those eggs will hatch out. And you do have better luck with the spray when they are the nymphs and they aren't full grown hard shelled adults. So um, again, certain times of the year and um, certain years, they'll be worse than others. Flea beetles are uh, again, a part of that beetle group. Um, they're not very large. In fact, they're very small. Um, they're not related to fleas, but they're called flea beetles because they jump like fleas. And typically the damage you'll see is tiny, tiny little holes because they're tiny little beetles. And when you see a whole bunch of tiny little holes, almost looks like what they call a shotgun pattern, um, then there's a good chance that you have flea beetles. And lots of times they'll be on the underside of the leaves, but it can also be on the upper side of the leaves. Um, and certain plants definitely are attractive to flea beetles. Like if you grow eggplants, you can almost count on them. Some years it's just so terrible that the four eggplant leaves are just riddled and, and are having a hard time. So you want to control them so that your plant can still produce enough food so it can make eggplant for you to eat. Um, another one is radish and turnips. They're pretty popular by flea beetles. Anyhow, if you go to try and touch one of these beetles, like poke it or touch it, you'll see it hop just like a, a flea and will spring away and then come back. So there are some organic chemical controls. Spinosad has some effectiveness and also pyrethrin. Uh, again, not the easiest one to control, but it's, it can be controlled somewhat using these organic controls. Leaf hoppers are actually part of that family group um, along with aphids, they're distantly related. They're tiny, they suck plant juices, they spread diseases like aphids do. Um, if you have tall grass, they multiply a lot. I've noticed them a lot like um, in the late summer, if I let my, my grass, I have some a field behind me that I mow, and if I let the grass get a little too tall, um, the leaf hoppers just multiply and I'll be walking through and I can literally just see them jumping, jumping around all over my feet. And um, of course they can spread diseases. So you want to control them and keep the grass as short as possible. Um, you can control them with neem oil and spinosad. And there's many, many different kinds. There's just pictures of different kinds, different colors, uh, but you'll see them hopping about, flying, um, as you uh, move about in taller grass. And then here's probably one of the most troublesome insects, uh, the squash bug. It's a terrible pest to squash. In fact, sometimes it is such a bad pest that people give up and say, I can't grow squash because this, this bug is so bad. And usually it's this bug and another bug. So there's two bad pests of squash, the squash bug, and the squash vine borer. And they are not related, but they both pick on squash. And we'll talk about the vine borer in a little bit. Right now, we'll talk about the squash bug. It's one of the true bugs. So it has the hard shell. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention about the identifying characteristic of the true bugs is they have a flat body as an adult that's kind of shaped like a shield. In fact, let's go back here and look real quick at um, 
there you can see that harlequin bug again that flat body shaped like a shield um, and so that's just kind of an indicator of that family oops there's our squash bug so again it has needle like mouth parts um, it penetrates into the leaf um, sucks juices uses enzymes to dissolve and just you know eat the leaves the adults have this hard shell they're pretty much almost immune to many insecticides at least um, most of the organic insecticides. Um, so there's different ways to control it. It's part of your IPM. One would be that you can um, actually handpick the eggs off the leaves. Um, if you look at this picture right here, you can see a little cluster of brown, tiny eggs all together. Those are the eggs of the squash bug. And what I'll do is literally just like take my fingernail and just rip a little, that little section holding those eggs out and then dispose of them. And then they won't hatch out. And that if you keep your eye, you don't really need very many zucchini plants if you can control this pest. So if you just have one or two or three zucchini plants or yellow squash or whatever, it's fairly easy to do that. Just keep your eye open, look underneath the leaves. Um, sometimes it's on the top of the leaves, sometimes it's on the bottom and keep picking those off. Um, at some point, if you have very many plants, that will be hard to do and um, might not be able to keep up. Um, but when they hatch, they turn into these little nymphs. And at first, they almost look like little tiny spiders. But instead of having eight legs, they have six legs. And then they creep around and they're starting to suck from the, the plant. And so they're starting to damage the plant and grow as, as they do that. And at that point, they can be sprayed um, with neem oil, pyrethrin, spinosad are all fairly effective against them. Um, and so if you keep doing that while they're young and vulnerable, then you'll be successful in controlling them. If you let them grow up, they get larger like this, and then eventually they get larger like this as an adult. Um, you won't be able to spray them. And the other thing is the adults, of course, they will be mating and then they'll be females will be laying eggs and spraying them all over. So um, they can just be a real, real bad pest for squash. Um, again, here's the close up of the nymphs. Uh, let's see, can, they're, they're gray and they're soft bodied um, and you can see what they look like and they can be controlled with organic insecticides at that stage. Um, The other thing you can do with the adults, which I, I guess I didn't mention here, is if you see them, is um, you can try to, to squash them, uh, but in the garden, in the dirt, you can step on them and they're so hard shelled that you can step on them and grind them into the dirt and they'll just get up and walk away. Um, but what you can also do though is, is hand pick them, throw them into a jar or bucket with soapy water and kill them that way. Um, and if you get those adults, then they won't be laying eggs. And so that was a good way to control them quite a bit. All right, stink bug um, is, you know, part of this bug family. In fact, generally all these bugs, lots of times they'll be called stink bugs, even the squash bug. Um, when, you, when you squash them, they have, emit a foul odor and that's why they're called stink bugs. Um, there's many, many different kinds of stink bugs. Um, some of them can ruin fruits. Um, one of the, the really troublesome ones is this marmorated stink bug that actually uh, affects it, the little blackberry fruits. You know how they have the little different um, parts in the fruit and you can see the ones that are off color like that, they have been fed upon by stink bug. And so that is really hard to control because it's a hard shell. Um, can ruin those fruits, can spread diseases, but again, try to get them at that immature stage with organic insect control. Um, here's another one called the tarnished plant bug, and it particularly likes strawberries. Um, it has piercing sucking mouth parts, damages soft fruits like strawberries, um, um, what they call cat facing, um, it sort of distorts. If you ever see a strawberry, it's just shaped really weird. 
Um, they call that cat facing because if you look at it from a certain viewpoint, it looks like the face of a cat. Um, but that means it's been fed on at a young stage, it's caused that fruit to be deformed. Um, they overwinter in leaf litter. So if you try to clean up your garden in the fall, that will help you know, control them. So that's just good garden sanitation to do things like that. All right, we talked about the squash bug. Now we're gonna talk about the squash vine borer. Um, the difference in these two as far as the damage, um, the squash bug will weaken the plant. Um, doesn't necessarily kill it, but just weakens it. Eventually it will die. Um, the squash vine borer, on the other hand, is a little tiny caterpillar and it's a larva, so it feeds inside the stem. It bores into the stem and eats the stem from the inside out. And the adults are this uh, moth. Uh, it's sort of a reddish brown moth you can see in the picture here. It almost looks like some kind of a wasp, but it's not a wasp, it's a moth. And it flies pretty fast. So lots of times you won't see it. And it will lay the eggs, um, feeds on flowers, so it, it's, excuse me, going after the nectar. Um, and again, as those eggs hatch, they're difficult to control because right away they start boring into the stalk. So they're not around. So unless you sprayed right at the time that they were hatching, you wouldn't catch them. Um, and so what happens is they eat the inside of that stalk and eventually um, the plant is so damaged on the inside that the plant can't take up water and it will just wilt and collapse. And if you've ever had that happen where you come out and you thought your zucchini plant or other squash plant or pumpkin or whatever was just fine and you come out and then one day it's collapsed and you think how did that happen in one day well it's been happening over a number of days you just weren't aware of it and so it's been eating that stalk from the inside out damaging the, the plant and stopping it from growing um so lots of times in books you'll read what it'll tell you is take a piece of wire and curve it and stick it into that stalk and move it around until you can try to kill those little caterpillars inside it. That's a great idea in theory, but it's not effective. And usually by that point, it's too late and the plant's gonna die. Anyhow. There is, um, you can control by using BT and spinosad sprays because they, remember, they attack members of the caterpillar family. Uh, the Lepidoptera, caterpillars, moths, butterflies. Um, and so it does work against them, but you have to spray fairly regularly in order to make sure that it will get them once they lay the eggs. Um, something else that you can do, a little bit different, excuse me, um, is to inject your plant. This sounds kind of strange, but if you have like a pumpkin plant or a squash plant, um, you can inject it by using a syringe. Uh, sometimes you can get one from a veterinary supply. Sometimes you can get um, order a syringe online that's not for humans, um, but uh, for, for vet stuff, for animals, or um, you know, even get a syringe without a needle and mix up a little BT and then inject it into the stock. You have to make a hole first um, you don't want to just stick the needle in because you're going to clog the needle if you do that. Uh, generally, you can take like a small nail and just poke a hole in the stalk so that there's an opening and then stick the syringe with or without a needle into the, the stalk and inject the, the BT. So use a, a strong concentrated version of it, stronger than you would for a spray. And what we'll do is that BT will move throughout the plant system and do this preventatively before the squash vine borers have taken over. To do this preventatively, it will be there. And when the squash vine borer larvae do bore in, the BT will already be there. They'll feed on it and so on. So, or at least they'll starve and they won't be able to survive. So that can be effective if you really struggle growing squash, effective way of trying to deal with the squash vine borer. Um, yet another caterpillar, which can be a problem, but again, doesn't happen very often. Um, may never have problems with it. Is the tomato hornworm. There's also another one called the tobacco hornworm. They're very similar. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Either one of them can eat your tomato plants. 
Sometimes you'll see them on eggplants, sometimes you'll see them on peppers, but most often they will be on your tomato plant. And the clue will be is you'll be looking at your tomato plant and all of a sudden wondering, that plant is missing a few leaves over there. What happened? And so you'll go and look at it because these are large caterpillars, um, about as big as your, your, your adult uh, finger, uh, pinky finger. And um, so they're pretty good size. Um, one of the easiest ways to control them is to um, just pan pick them off and get rid of them, squash them, whatever. Because there's usually not too many. Um, this moth is fairly large, it flies at night. You won't likely see it. Um, and then occasionally you'll run across one of these on your plants and you'll see in the bottom picture here, strange little white things on the back. And what those are is that sign that the bat has been parasitized by a wasp that lays eggs and it, um, the little larva of the wasp will actually feed on the caterpillar and then they'll fly around, become adults, and they'll fly around and parasitize other um, of the larva, of the hornworm larva. So, it really is a natural biological control that you'll see. So if you ever see one that has these little white capsules on the back, let it be there so that it will continue to do its job and help keep the hornworms under control naturally. All right, rips. Um, this is something, an insect that most people aren't even aware of because they're so tiny, you don't really see them. Um, they're you know, flowers sometimes, but more often, I see them on onions, garlic, members of that family. And you won't actually see them unless you look really, really close because they're so tiny. But what you'll see is you'll see white flecks on the leaves of your onion and whitish, yellowish little, little spots. And you'll think, what's going on there? And you'll think, oh, they're just getting old. Sometimes it is they're getting old. And that's because the drips have been feeding on them for a while. Um, in really bad years, the temperatures can be troublesome. So um, it makes the thrips multiply, you know, as it gets warmer in the spring and the onions suffer. So it's not so much a problem unless it comes so bad that it weakens the plant um, because you're not going to necessarily be eating the top unless you're growing them for scallions. If you're growing them for scallions, they aren't around as long, so typically the strips don't have time to get established as much. Um, but they don't necessarily affect the bulb, but they affect the leaves, so the bulb may not develop as large as it should if there's too many strips. Um, organic control would be using neem oil uh, or spinosis. So. Uh, another beetle here, the bean leaf beetle. Um, Typically, if you have green beans or other types of beans, lima beans, and you see holes in your leaves, more often than not, it is the bean leaf beetle. Although we'll talk about another pest, another beetle here in a minute. Um, larva will feed on roots. But the adults are the ones that do a lot of damage to feed on the, the leaves and the fruits. Um, sometimes if you plant just a little bit later than the ideal planting time, that will help keep them under control because they will not be growing during the, the right life cycle. Um, and spray them with pyrethrin. Um, and here you can see the large holes, the different kinds of bean leaf beetle. Um, there's a Mexican leaf bean beetle, there's some other ones. Um, but basically they're all similar and they eat lots of holes in your leaf beans. Um, sometimes you'll go out and look at them and you'll see all these holes but you won't see any buds. And sometimes that's because they've moved on. They've already moved on to the next part of their life cycle and they're not around. So they're not laying eggs and you may not need to worry about them anymore. But if you do see any active feeding happening on the new leaves, that's usually a sign that they are still present. All right, let's talk about the Japanese beetle. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, coverage, uh, more gardeners are having problems with Japanese beetles. They didn't used to be in this part of the country. They were farther out east. They've been gradually moving their way west over the last few years. And so now they're fairly common. And most people have problems with Japanese beetles on one thing or another. The larvae actually feed on the roots of, of lawn grass or grass plants. 
the adults feed on the leaves of all different plants. And um, it's interesting, sometimes different years it will be able to pick on some plants more than others. They do seem to pick on roses a lot if you try to grow roses. We try and grow grapes, they'll pick on them a lot, and cherry trees, they seem to love all of them. But beyond that, they'll also just eat whatever they darn well want to eat. Um, and, you know, sprays aren't super effective. Um, one of the solutions would be to hand pick. Um, we have them on a certain type of flower called the canna lily, or just cannas, at our children's garden. It's a large plant, big leaves. And of course, the Japanese beetles love to eat the leaves. And so um, we try to pick as many as we can by hand, and that's pretty effective. Um, but, um, you know, we also put out traps. And you'll hear lots of different things about the traps. Some people say traps are a bad idea because they just draw the pest to your, um, your plants. And there is some truth to that. And so typically they recommend putting the trap kind of on the edge of the garden, not right in the middle of it, um, or a little bit away from the garden, and that will attract the Japanese beetles to get caught in the trap and you can get rid of them. They are such a bad pest and they set such big holes and they'll keep chomping and chomping away. And at some point they finish their life cycle and you don't see them so much anymore. But uh, in the middle of summer, they are a bad pest. And if you, um, want to find out how to make your own traps, you can uh, buy um, the lures and the traps and set up the thing to make your own trap and catch lots and lots of beetles. Um, so that can work really, really well. We've had good luck with it um, in our orchard sites and also in our children's garden. Spider mites, well, we're almost done here. Just got a couple more here to do. Um, Spider mites are actually um, not insects. They're a relative of spiders. They're very small, very difficult to see. Um, you typically don't see them unless you're looking real close and know where to look. Typically on the underside of the leaves, um, they multiply very fast when it's hot and dry. So in of course, in late summer, July and August, they can be very bad, especially on tomatoes. That's where I see them the most. And you'll see, your tomato leaves will have little tiny yellow markings on them and you just think they're getting sick or something. What that is, it's the piercing, sucking mouth parts of the spider mites um, on the underside of the leaf. And there's the different kinds. Um, the one, the upper one, upper picture here is called the two-spotted spider mite, but this is a, an enlargement. So just with the naked eye without a magnifying glass, wouldn't be able to see if they have two spots on them. The other one is called just the red spider mite. That attacks a lot of house plants. Um, and so that one is red, obviously. Sometimes that shows up a little bit against the green leaf and you can see them better. Um, they can actually kill tomato plants, but there's enough of them. And especially when it's hot and dry. So sometimes, typically, you don't recommend watering the leaves of the tomatoes to try and avoid that. Um, but if you do have spider mites, you can take your hose and squirt the leaves, the underside of the leaves really hard, and that will help knock off a lot of spider mites. Um, but you can also control them with neem oil, safer soap, they kind of smother the spider mites, and also pyrethrin. We've had really good uh, work, success with using pyrethrin to do organic pesticide also. There you can see a close-up of the damage on um, the, the tomato leaves. That's what the leaf would look like. And you'll see that and say, what's going on there? Is it just sick with the disease? It's not, it's actually spider mites, you know, if it's in the summer. And underneath, you can kind of barely, barely see, you have to look really close to see the spider mites, to see what they look like. And our last pest here is this one. It's also not a true insect, it's actually uh, a mollusk, you know, it's related to snails. And um, other things that live in shells, some of the um, seafood that you eat are mollusks. Um, damage almost always happens at night. They're night feeders. Um, they like cool, moist weather. They like mulch. Normally mulch is a good thing, but sometimes in the early spring, you put down mulch like straw. They like to hide underneath the straw. 
um, keep cool. So you can avoid a little bit by not using straw at the very beginning of the season, might go it warms up a little bit, and that can be helpful. Um, there's also some organic controls and organic bait. You see, if you go to the garden center, you'll see slug bait. But do not just buy any old slug bait. Buy uh, a brand name or a type called Sluggo. Uh, there's other brand names that have this, but it should have iron phosphate. And it's not a very dangerous chemical at all. It's just a mineral chemical, and it controls slugs very well. Very well. Um, one of the plants that has the most problem would be lettuce, especially in the cool, wet spring. We'll see um, slugs sometimes on the inside has your lettuce, which is very discouraging. Uh, but also sometimes you'll just see like a whole seedling, like a whole lettuce seedling just be totally devoured. And that typically is from a slug who's just eaten the whole leaf or the whole seedling. So uh, they can eat a lot in a short amount of time. All right, so you've been hearing me talk about some of these uh, pesticides. Um, these are kind of the main ones that have the most use, and the top three or four are probably even the most useful. Neem oil um, controls lots of different kinds of insects. So no said we talked about that. Um, and of course, they'll have brand names for both of those. BT also has its brand name. Uh, BT or Bacillus thuringiensis um, is the one that kills members of the caterpillar family. It won't do anything for anything else. Like if you've got beetle problem, you can put all the BT on there you want, it won't do a thing. So people get a little bit confused about that sometimes think, why isn't it working? Well, that's because you're using it on something that's not a member of the category. Now. So, um, pyrethrin is a very uh, good uh, organic insecticide and uh, controls lots of different types of things. And safer soap, that soap product, that's good for some of the smaller things like spider mites and aphids. Because what it does is it smothers them, it smothers their skin. And so it makes it difficult for them to um, inspire or breathe. And so um, it controls it. So those are the materials. You can feel good about using those materials. You still need to follow instructions and be careful how you spray them and you know, right time of day. I like doing it in the evening so you're not likely to affecting the pollinators. Um, so just, again, be careful. But again, these are the ones to look for. And you can find them in different places. We carry some of them here at the Kansas City Community Gardens. Uh, but you can also order them online. Um, I've had a good selection, or it's available at Gardens Alive, and it's just gardensalive.com. There's also a company called Arbico, which um, sells a lot to commercial growers, but homeowners can buy stuff from them. They also sell a lot of the predators, like the lace wings or ladybugs or praying mantises and things like that, if you want to try those. And then also there's a seed catalog that has some of these materials also, Johnny's Selected Seeds. They have good seeds, but they also carry lots of interesting tools and insect controls. So, um, I think that's it on our presentation. So I'm going to check with Rob and see if we had any questions that people had. Uh, yeah, we have a few questions. Let me send them your way. OK. Uh, there is one where uh, they, somebody asked you to spell the, uh, the aphid biocontrol, if you know uh, the. Oh, yes, sure. So yeah, we could do that. Maybe do that in the chat. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, just send you an email with the other questions. Yeah, um, actually, I'm, I have a hard time connecting to the chat sometimes, but I'll just spell it. It's Lace Wing, L-A-C-E-W-I-N-G. Um, if you just Google that, um, you can find out all about them. And that Arbico company, they sell Lace Wing eggs. Uh, they sell the adults and the larvae too, but really the eggs are the most effective and the most cost effective because they're the most inexpensive. Um, let me see if I can get to my email. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so um, let me get back to my screen here. Uh, All right, so questions, um, homemade sprays, do they work? Um, again, I am not a big fan of just simply spraying soapy water because there's just not as much um, scientific work done to know like how strong the soap to use. Again, some of the soaps are stronger than others, the different materials. Um, so I just prefer to use like a commercial product like the Safer Soap. There's other brands too. Um, and because you know what you're getting and you know how strong to dilute it and um, it doesn't have other chemicals in there as well. So I think that works much better. You know, some people try the dish soap and you can find formulas for that. If you want to try that and it works without damaging your plants, great. Uh, I'm not going to discourage you because it's not going to be like super toxic or anything, but it's just, harder to figure out to make it the right strength. Um, vinegar water, um, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, people sometimes think, talk about using homemade sprays of that. Um, lots of times they're using that to try and kill weeds, but it's not strong enough to kill weeds. I haven't really heard of it being very effective killing insects. Um, I have heard people make homemade sprays from garlic and hot peppers, and those uh, can be very effective. And so basically what you're doing is you're taking garlic and um, like hot peppers. You have to be careful with the hot peppers so you're not touching um, the oil from the hot peppers, the, the juice uh, to your uh, nasal passages or your eyes or your lips or anything because you don't want to burn yourself with that. But um, put that stuff in the blender. You can find recipes for that too and along with the garlic and then kind of make a, a liquid spray out of that you have to strain it out so you don't get solid stuff in there. But that can be very effective for many insects. And you can actually buy some materials based on hot pepper and garlic too. There's also some oil sprays out now, like uh, different like uh, peppermint oil or different herb, herb herbal oils that um, can be effective against some insecticides and some insects too. So they work as insecticides also. Just haven't had as much experience or seen as much research on those yet but some of those are supposed to be fairly effective. Um, so yeah, we spelled the aphid biocontrol, the lace wings. Um, there's also some other things like ladybugs, for instance, are in biocontrol. Um, and there's some wasps that you can order too. Um, but we've had good luck using the lace wings. Um, so when you spray the aphids off with water, the question was, do they just live in the soil and reinfect the plants? Um, generally not. Um, so aphids, you know, have a hard time moving around. And so um, if you spray them off, A, they're not going to just like climb right back up on the plant. Um, you basically kind of just disrupted their whole life cycle. Their life won't be long enough to live to where they could get back onto the plant because they need to be not just on the stalk, they need to would get back all the way to the very tip of that plant where the soft tissue is because they, they can't just pierce the hard stalk or the hard older leaves. They have to get to the very, very young part of the plant in order to do that. So washing them off seems to work very effectively. They don't come back and bother you well. All right, so if I, pray, if I spray Captain Jack's and then it rains, do I spray again? Yes, you would need to because pretty much um, if, again, things like Captain Jack's or the uh, BT are only going to be effective for like 24 to 48 hours. So if you spray them or put the dust out and then it rains, you know, like within that short period, that 24 hours, basically you just washed it off. Um, so just really try to watch the forecast and not put it on uh, before it rain. Usually you can look at that forecast and it'll tell you, yeah, there's no chance of rain the next two or three days. 
And most of the time they will be right. So that's when a good time to spray or use dust. And again, use it in the evening, uh, not likely to bother any pollinators at that point. And uh, this, uh, the other thing is these materials, they break down with the sunlight. So if you're using Captain Jack's, the Spinosad or the BT or the Pyrethrum, the sunlight breaks them down. So that's another reason why you want to put them out in the evening. That way they'll be effective and stronger for a longer period of time. And I think that's all the questions. Um, if you do have more questions, you can always uh, send an email to contact at kccg.org. And um, we'll try to answer your questions that way. Um, and just a little bit, if you're not familiar with the Kansas City Community Gardens, I'd like to just recommend you take a look at our website. Just you can either Google Kansas City Community Gardens. We have a fantastic website. Lots of useful information uh, about plants and about growing things uh, that will help you regardless of where you live, especially here in the Midwest. And um, lots of great videos, educational resources on how to take care of your plants, how to deal with problems, how to grow plants, et cetera, how to plant them, all kinds of useful things. And these workshops as well, you can find them there also. Uh, so visit our website. Also come out and visit us in person at the Kansas City Community Gardens. Um, our office is located at 6917 Kensington here in School Park. We're near the Nature Center and uh, the Pet Project, so in the zoo, close to all those places. And also we have a special children's garden, which is opening up here June 1st. The Beanstalk Children's Garden is a fantastic garden where you can see lots of great plants and all different kinds of food plants and flowers and you can see lots of insects too easily so um, if you want to arrange a tour for your group of children like a school class or a summer day camp group or any kind of group of children girl scout troop whatever um, you can contact us also through the contact uh, email or call Kansas City Community Gardens phone number which is 816-931-3877 so I want to wish you well with your gardening. Hope you can beat the bugs. I think you can if you um, keep looking for them and watching. And um, we're going to be having another workshop on weeds coming up in a few weeks. And I know a lot of people are anxious to see that one because it's gotten postponed a couple of times. So that's the other thing. If you can beat the weeds and beat the bugs, you should have a very successful garden. So thank you, everybody, for coming and uh, hope to see you soon. Yeah, thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a good night.